Yo, boys, welcome back. As promised, um, we are into the wide world of sports betting, which um, I think you'll find has quite a bit more to do with political gambling than you think. Um, What do you think, um, Anthony? I'm here with Anthony DeBondo from the Action Network. Is this kind of like a little study abroad where you kind of learn more about your home country by going to spend some time in Rome or uh, Paris or something like that? Yeah, definitely. You know, there's a lot of similarities. Most people, I think, in the sports and political worlds don't overlap a ton. So you might not realize it. Most people who like sports don't care about politics. You know, they're like the stick to sports people. And then most people who care about politics just think their sports are dumb. Uh, But I'm kind of in the weird overlap with people who just love information, numbers and predicting things. And you'll find that the overlap is pretty cool. And it's it's fun and refreshing to talk about things in a different context sometimes. So so if you're a sports betting guy, uh, again, I'll highlight that you're affiliated with the Action Network, which really I think is kind of the gold standard of sports betting right now. Um, but if you're a sports betting guy uh, and you care about politics, does that mean you're also a sports betting guy who says stuff like, well, wow, football is getting really girly, like, uh, you know, Troy Aikman style, got to take off the dresses. I mean, that feels like sports politics, doesn't it? You'd think so. Uh, I think you know, the sports betting industry is in general, like the political leanings of people who are into sports betting are definitely the kind of people who would make those kind of comments. I'm one of, I'm like one of those nerds who just like yells from the couch when the coach doesn't go for it on fourth down yeah. or yells when the, um, when the, when the broadcasters are saying really dumb things about like momentum and yeah. uh, talking about, you know, you got to take the points and play field position because it's, it's so mathematically not optimal. So like that's, that's my sports fandom, but there are definitely people who are like, you know, getting all tribal about like how sports need to be rah-rah and you have to hit the guy hard. Like that's never been my thing, but people definitely do love that. About well, then it. And, like I, I can appreciate that. I want to congratulate you then because I remember it was a very lonely road to walk in like 2010 to say momentum was fake and made up. And I feel like, like, congratulations, you won that argument. Isn't momentum is fake, right? It, it's not. I think there's definitely like an element that the players believe in it. So it matters, but I mean, anytime somebody talks about momentum, they always talk about it after the fact. After something has happened, they say, oh, that really swung the momentum. But it's not predictive in any way, shape, or form. Otherwise, you would just live bet a team every time they scored a touchdown, right? They have the momentum now. And that would not work out for you very well in the long run. (laughs) <laughs> right, right. Well, and like I would think dumb. So we'll, we'll start talking about actually betting soon, boys. But I would think dumb stuff like that, like the higher the skill level you're talking about, you know, the more those types of variables just net out. I mean, you're like we're talking about trained professionals who have exactly. rehearsed their entire lives for these games. Like they better be mentally tough and you better believe they are, right? Yeah, a team has momentum and then people only talk about it when that continues to be the end result but how many times do we see these random comebacks or back and forth games and nobody ever talks about momentum in those circumstances because it doesn't apply so it's kind of like a bias that people have with regards to sports and, and sports betting especially you know people love to live bet certain teams when they're down points they only remember when they do come back not when they don't all right well let me ask you one question before we kind of get into our betting format here um do you believe in momentum in politics i think that's a very different thing I think absolutely momentum in politics is real. You'll see it more so uh, in the bandwagon effect, you know, with, with closing primaries, you know, I'll, I don't know if you guys disclose your own politics, but like me personally, I was very undecided in the Pennsylvania democratic primary. And then I, when we got to the very end of the race, I was like, you know what? I kind of bought into the whole belief that lamb ran a, a bad campaign. Fetterman ran a strong campaign. I voted for him. So like, that's kind of the bandwagon effect. A lot of people around me were undecided and said, okay, you know, Everybody else is voting for Fetterman. I want to be on the winning team. Yeah. So I'll do that too. And that's what we saw with Biden too in 2020 was, you know, he was struggling and then everybody decided, all right, we're all just going to show up to vote for Joe on Super Tuesday. And that's basically what won the primary. Well, you're, you're, you're proving one of our recent guests, right? Charles McElwee, who's uh, he's a kind of a Harrisburg hardo, was just on last week saying that the uh, Philadelphia suburbs are where the real John Fetterman base is. So uh, perhaps your demographics were destiny um, in this case, Anthony. We'll see what happens in November. I'm less less bullish. Uh, yeah, we could talk about that for sure. Um, okay, so so my vision for this, uh, I'm just going to pitch you the sort of low risk strategies to start making money betting on politics, and maybe you just spit them back at me as how you bet on sports. So, um, all right, so uh, I'll, I'll start. You can pitch me tactics too. This is a podcast. This isn't fucking live TV. Um, all right, so when I look for an easy way to bet on politics. I think one of the first things to do is figure out who has like a giant cult around them, like 
personality cults. And usually that means Bernie Sanders. Usually that means Donald Trump. And just fade candidates who have cults around them. Like there's the odds will always reward you for fading cults. So um, you ever do that betting like NFL or anything? Yeah, I think NFL is especially one of the biggest sports for this because everybody bets the NFL. Your mom bets the NFL, your cousin, your coworker around the corner. Like everybody thinks they know everything about betting the NFL. And people love to lay it with the big favorites. People love to bet on teams that just had big wins the week before. In fact, the math shows that if you just blindly bet against every team that had won by 10 points or more the following week and was favored the week after, you would only win about 40% of the time. So you're making a 40% bet if you bet on teams who won big last week and then are favored the following week. So you're, you're looking at teams like, for example, everybody was decided that the Bills and the Eagles had won the Super Bowl after week two because on Monday Night Football, they went and they destroyed the Titans and the Vikings. Well, what happened the next week? The Bills went to Miami as a six-point road favorite, lost outright. So, you know, it's a week-to-week -week league, but I think generally speaking, the same thing, right? These certain teams, and there are certain public teams, you yeah. know, every year, Green Bay, Pittsburgh, New England when they had Brady, now Tampa Bay. People like to say, oh, Tom Brady won't lose two in a row. Well, he did. Tom Brady won't uh, lose three in a row. You have to lay eight points against the Falcons. They didn't cover. So, you know, I think people generally like to bet on the best teams who tend to get overvalued. And these are the teams that have the biggest following because people watch them in prime time and they know the names of the big players. You know, I, I, I think it works even deeper in politics too, because if I can think of times I've lost money or made money, but um, it's like there are these heuristics in your head, like Tom Brady's a winner. You know, the Packers and the Steelers are always good. You know, they're real good in the winter when the weather gets cold and that type of stuff. Like it, it, it was really easy to make money this past year betting that Gavin Newsom, the governor of California, would win San Diego because everyone has it in their head that San Diego is where the most Republicans are in California. Newsflash. Democrats have like a 60-40 registration advantage for them down there. So it's like if you can just get past the things that everyone thinks they know, um, there's usually some place where you can bank the insight. Um, uh, okay, let me, let me ask you a different version of the same question, okay? So if I'm trying to learn how to make money betting on politics, I think the best place to learn is in the super high volume stuff like presidential elections and nominations for the Republican, you know, president and the Democratic presidential nominee, because like the market's just more predictable. There's more volume. You can get in, you can get out. But it sounds to me like maybe you're saying to do the opposite in sports that like betting the NFL is actually kind of a trap if you're new and not quite so experienced. Yeah, I think that's very true. You know, every like I said, everybody bets the NFL. So it is the most basically the most efficient betting market in the world. And the closing line in the NFL, if you try to, you know, fire drill live betting or or try to live bet or bet right before kickoff on Sunday, you'll find that those are the most efficient lines in all of sports betting. And it is hard. Uh the the sharp a lot of sharp bettors bet earlier in the week. They try to get an edge on the market by doing so, by getting out ahead of injury information, by getting out ahead of uh, you know, who may be in, who may be out. Uh, why is this team so overpriced off of last week? Is the market going to move back toward them? You know, those little things I do. I mean, people do bet on Sunday and there's a lot more money that moves around on Sunday and you can still find an edge betting on Sunday. But I think we're seeing more and more of this as the space becomes so much more populated that people are going to stuff like player props. If you can, you know, identify usage, you know, so many people do fantasy football, the amount of work you're putting in to try to figure out who's going to get the most fantasy points for you you could put a lot of that work into player props and figuring out how many yards is, is this person going to get uh, and how many uh, receptions, how many targets, what's their target share. Like people are doing more in props now. And just because it's a smaller market, you can actually find more of an edge in those kind of betting markets. I say the same thing for other sports. If you're trying to bet uh, the NBA or, or baseball, props are becoming the market, I think that's more exploitable. Of course, you have to do more work to do that, right? You have to know yes, the players, yes. the ins and outs, the schemes. But I think that's an interesting way of going at it. But for most people, betting is recreational, right? You want to get in on a Sunday and you want to put your three bets in and root for those teams. You know, you want to bet your favorite team or bet against them. So right. I don't blame people who just bet sides in total. Well, so so I think actually we have more in common than we thought on this answer, because if I think about, um, you know, once you're kind of a mid-tier political gambler, um, 
the easiest way to make money is not to be right. Again, it's a great thing about political gambling is you don't really need to be right because you can trade out of your position whenever you get ahead. Um, but it's just to be one move ahead. Like it's to understand that the polls in Pennsylvania, that there's no way that, you know, John Fetterman having had a stroke is a 75, 25 favorite over Dr. Oz, a TV star and heart surgeon, like that, that line is going to get closer to 50, 50. So just, you know, take odds at 25 percent and sell them when you get to, you know, 40 or 50 and the world catches up with you. So I, that's that to me is like betting, like betting on Monday, you know, bet on Monday. Um, you know, you know, those injuries are going to come out or, you know, whatever it may be. And that the money is going to kind of move in your direction if you're just patient and, you know, have some some uh, strong hands. Absolutely. And then you can even introduce, you know, the concept of middling. You know, I'll do sometimes uh, where a line will be, let's say a team is minus two and a half at home, but I know that that market is going to move to four. Yeah, uh, I'll grab two and a half. I'll come back on the other team at four. Uh, over thirteen percent of the time, an NFL game lands on three. So you have yeah. a good chance of winning both of those bets. Uh, what's called middling. So I, you know, you'll see that it's it's hard to do because the market is efficient to begin with. You yeah. can do that more kind of in college, you know, smaller markets, stuff like that. But in the NFL, three and seven are king. So if you can get around those key numbers, you got a good chance. Yeah, yeah, and you can do that in politics by betting what's called margin of victory. But let's not belabor that. I guess before we move off this, I do want to ask. I said that you know betting presidential races, betting uh, presidential nominees is usually the best way to learn. Um, I, I guess I would ask you, what is like? Should people start out betting um, cricket matches in like Sri Lanka or you know WNBA games or what? Like where do you where do you start if you want to learn? That's a question I get all the time, and I never know the right answer because I think. The, it's different for everybody, you know, bet the sport, you know, the most for me, the, the, the sport that I grew up betting was of course, everybody bets the NFL, but it was college basketball and baseball yeah. for me. Those are my first two loves, uh, as a fan, as a kid growing up. Uh, and so, you know, college basketball is such an information game. It's so centered. There's so many teams, you know, there's, there's yeah. over 350 college basketball teams. If you become an expert on matchups and understanding just how the game is played and understanding you know, what team has an edge. Maybe you specialize in like a couple of conferences. Maybe you're a huge NHL fan who has a really good feel for the game and, and a feel for the teams. Um, you know, you understand analytics a little bit, you know, regression to the mean is a huge thing that we talk about, you know, using underlying numbers, you know, in, in hockey, for example, a team can go on an incredible finishing run where they're just scoring all their shots. That's not going to continue. The best right. teams create the most shots, right? So uh, using kind of uh, the, the, the same tactics you know buying low and selling high on certain teams is always going to be king especially in pro sports i can't tell you how many times i'll i'll bet a team like you know last year the jets were playing the titans the titans were 2 and 0 jets were 0 and 2 everybody's saying the jets are so bad they're so bad they're still a professional football team in the nfl yeah uh, you have to be careful with kind of how far down they can go but i think uh, just understanding matchups learning information and kind of trial and error. I mean, you're going to lose bets when you first start, right? It's like political gambling. You're going to be a novice. You're going to have to learn, listen to people who are smarter than you, read people who are smarter than you and and kind of learn how they do it and, and try to emulate that. It's kind of, yeah. yeah. Best Again, advice. I'm just like, I think we are just totally in sync intellectually here. Cause you know what? Another great way to learn in political gambling, pick your home state. Like you probably know where the wackos live in your home state. You probably know where the limousine liberals and the, you know, dentists who secretly have, you know, MAGA hats in their back office. Like, you know where all these things are in your home state. Figure out how your state works and you'll have a template to learn how, you know, states that you don't really understand work too. So um, once again, just, you know, making it look easy here, Anthony. Thank you so much. Um, all right, I'm going to pitch you another, okay? Um, don't trade elections don't predict who's going to win elections trade the results wait until the wait until the votes are being counted and um you know do a little homework before so that you understand what counties need to come in for which party and and uh and just and just trade on the day don't worry about predicting elections it's very hard to predict elections so just make informed guesses uh based on what you know about the state that you tried to master before the election day um I don't know. You got a you got a you got a comparable strategy for me. Yeah, I think the clear parallel here is kind of live betting, right? And that's become more and more popular in sports betting as a whole. It can be a dangerous game. You could be chasing results and trying to you know double down, double down, double down. And you run into a dangerous situation because elections are a little different because they only happen every so often. There's not really variance because you can kind of 
if you're really in the weeds, you know, yeah. you watch the New York Times needle or you're, you know, you're like Nate Cohn or redistrict and you're, you're studying the, the districts and you know what each person needs to get in every county to win, right? If you're doing that, like you generally know how a county is going to vote most of the time. And so you can kind of do the math. Whereas in sports, there's so much variance, you know, especially in football, you're talking about like bounce of the ball here, a deflection there. Like there's so many more flukes that happen yeah. in one NFL game. Uh, but I think you can definitely identify trends. Uh, I think the biggest one so far this season, at least, you know, to give a concrete example, has been the Titans. Yeah. They have scored on their first drive in every game this season. They are number one in offense in the first quarter. Offensive coordinators in the NFL t- tend to script out plays the first two drives or so. After the second quarter, so after halftime, they are the worst offense in the NFL. They have scored seven second half points in the last three weeks. We're recording this at a week six. Those are the kind of things that if you can notice that and do your homework ahead of time, you can say, hey, Tennessee goes up seven, goes up four, you know, early. I want to fade them. I want to live bet the other team because I know their offense is not sustaining itself. Uh, certain teams, <laughs> the Chiefs are the classic example, right, in the NFL. They were down 17 nothing to the Raiders. I'm sure there was a lot of money that sportsbooks lost because everybody knows, hey, it's time to live bet the Chiefs. They're the comeback kings. Yeah. Same thing with the Warriors for years in the NBA. You know, there are certain teams that are on the level to the point where you can catch money, you know, betting against them in baseball, looking at bullpens. This bullpen has been used a ton in the last two days. They're all tired. They're all going to struggle to get outs today. I want to lie about the other team. This bullpen's really rested. I want to lie about the under. So you can kind of get at it in that way, in an analytical way. But again, you have to remember, there's a lot of flukes in one game of any sport. Yeah, so I'm fascinated, and now I'm off script, which means you're really interesting. Um, like, how do you, is there like a systematic way to learn that? Because I don't really entirely know that there's, you know, a systematic chapter one, chapter two, chapter three to really understand politics, other than to just be curious and get into it and just take things one at a time, and eventually they'll kind of connect. But like, I mean, is there a curriculum of study to do like the things you're saying to me would not be obvious to me. They might be obvious to everyone, you know, but they're really not obvious to me. So, I mean, is there a a yellow brick road or is it just watch a lot of games? You know, one of my colleagues, Stucky, he's been betting sports for like 15, 20 years. He used to work in the financial industry. He talks about, uh, you know, behavioral finance being a big part, behavioral economics, thinking about concepts that people biases that we have as people and as fans of sports that make us think one thing will happen when the reality is much more, you know, based in math and based in numbers. Um, I've, I've read a few books on, on that kind of stuff. Uh, that's really interesting. That's so kind it's of like the Daniel Kahneman me. shit, like, you know, thinking fast and thinking slow and uh, yeah, you know, bas- basically like yeah. risk analysis and all that stuff. And that all goes into political stuff too. Right. Yeah. Uh, but I think, um, understanding the sport on like an, on a, on a, on trying to go on a deeper level. And like most people, they work, you know, real jobs and they have lives and they don't have time to like dig into the quarter by quarter splits of the Tennessee Titans. Right. right. Like that's the hard part. Uh, and I think that's where you, know, you guys talk on your show about like going deep into like the, the political happenings in Oregon and like reading through documents and like public information and stuff. Like most people don't have the time to do that. Yeah. Uh, but sometimes that's kind of where the edge is. So, you know, it's it's hard to say that, like, you can just walk in tomorrow and and know how, you know, the Phillies bullpen is looking today. Yeah. Uh, but you, you kind of develop that through more research. It's really the only thing I can say. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you almost have to kind of just enjoy doing it because it's a lot of work right. for an uncertain payoff. Right. And the, look, and the beauty of it is sometimes like you'll have losing weeks. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely. part of the variance of it all. Definitely. So the next thing I was going to pitch you was um, fade market panic. But I feel like that's sort of what we've been talking about here is like when everyone else gets super agitated about the latest breaking story, just like chill out because very rarely is the latest breaking story, um, you know, the thing that's going to actually resolve the question of, you know, who will win or what, you know, but it, it sounds like that's just another question of just accept variance and don't let it deter you. Yeah, I think in the NFL, it's kind of like the big name player is out versus like the small time O lineman that nobody's heard of, but is actually like super important for the offensive line is out. I think that's the biggest difference, right? Like uh, Jonathan Taylor was ruled out for the Colts last week. He's a great player, like led the league in rushing last year. But the way the Colts O line is playing, you could have had Barry Sanders, Jonathan Taylor, or me behind the (laughs) offensive line, and they weren't going to be able to run the ball on Denver, and they weren't able to run the ball at all. 
Yeah. So how much does that matter versus, oh, shoot, like the Eagles might be out 3-0 linemen this week. Well, that's a big issue because you look at the backups last week and they couldn't block anybody. So people will react more to the, the fantasy players, yeah. people they know. That yeah. Are out. yeah. They so- will not react to O-linemen, D-linemen, this really important safety, uh, you know, the coach – uh, switched the scheme last week or something, and and now they're stopping the run. Like so, there's little things that kind of go into and affect the the markets. Yeah, yeah. I I mean, my co-host uh, Pratik Chogli is a real master of a version of this trade where he always buys. He always bets that the current vice president will be the president within the term. So like he basically always bets that the president will die because the president always is old these days. Uh, you know, there's always going to be a health scare. The health scare is always going to push, you know, the the probability from one or two percent to maybe five or ten. Or in Trump's case, when he got COVID, twenty five percent odds that uh, he was going to be gone from office from death. You know, but again, it's like just one of those things where it's like you know the market's going to panic a certain way. You know, a certain story is always going to come. So why not have a little money waiting there, a little honey trap? Uh, you know, if and when the dumb the dumb money floods the marketplace. So um, God bless. It's fascinating you say that because uh, last night I was having a discussion with somebody uh, who was asking me about Trump getting indicted. Yeah. And I was like, I wonder if there's a market on that. So I just Googled predicted Trump indicted market. And I realized that there's been like five separate markets in the last five years. Yeah. And I'm thinking, man, I wish I had bet no, 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 no every single time because that's yeah. just free money. Because I told this person, I was like, I don't think he's getting indicted. Uh, and then nothing is definitely happening before the midterms. So we just kept. Now I was like, but there's no active market, but there's been so many already settled markets where I'm just like, yeah, like people love to get ginned up about like the next big thing that's going to happen in politics, right? Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And it's yeah. kind of the same thing in sports. So uh, selling news is always a good idea. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Buy the rumor, sell the news, right? Let's, let's, let's throw that out there. Okay, so I'm going to pitch you one last one and then I'll invite you if you have any that I haven't touched on. Um, I'm actually, I will be a little bit surprised if you tell me you have a comp to this. So there's something um, enigmatic about, inefficient, I guess I should say, about how political markets are settled. Like, for example, Liz Cheney, uh, the Republican who is out to, you know, politically uh, destroy Donald Trump, um, lost her primary. Trump kind of put out a hit on her. She's done. She's not going to be in office next year. But the way that the bet on her being in office next year is structured it doesn't pay until January. So because of that, you can still get like a five or 6% coupon just by bet, you know, just to just to bet on something that's an assured outcome. So that's a long and complicated way of saying, look for markets where the event and the resolution are really far apart because most people will take their money out. They'll take 96, 95, 97 cents on the dollar now rather than you know leaving their money in for another six months. And you can just park money in these things safely and just collect kind of a 5% return indefinitely by being patient. So are there like, I don't know, are there any weird inefficiencies in sports markets like that where you can just basically provide liquidity and, and count your money later? Uh, nothing in like an act where an actual event needs to occur. Right. Because yeah. anything can happen in an event. Uh, and you know, you'll hear people be like, Oh, this minus 1000, just bet it. It'll win. Uh, yeah. every once in a while they don't. Right. And you need yeah. to win a lot of times. Right. Yeah. Uh, but there are some markets like, like awards markets. Uh, yeah. the most interesting example I have was the NBA MVP last year. I am not an NBA guy by any stretch. I bet the NBA, like occasionally I'll just like throw a bet on the warriors because they're fun to watch and they're really good. Yeah. But I don't bet the NBA heavily at all, but there was a straw poll that came out like a week before the season ended, maybe two weeks on who the people who already had votes were considering voting for MVP. And Jokic, the Nuggets center, had like twice as many votes as Embiid, who was the second favorite. But the betting markets were in, of the belief that it was really a toss up or that Embiid should have been favored. So you could have bought Jokic at plus 140 or plus 150. Uh-huh. which is like 40% implied when you just heard from the voters, essentially that they were going to vote for Jokic unless something drastic happened in the last two weeks, which by that point, everybody's just kind of chilling for the playoffs. So nothing's really going to change. And so I put a bet down. I said, all right, I'll take Jokic at plus 150 to win the MVP. And then he won. And a few months later was crowned MVP. So I know a lot of people who got down a lot of money books were hanging lines that were just sitting there. And you're like, that's wrong. Uh, and then I guess the other example, you know, it's not a guaranteed payout, but this was especially true in the COVID era. 
if you were really fast and you had like a book up and you got the Schefter notification, Aaron Rodgers has COVID, will not play. Yeah, that yeah. line's moving. A, that line's going to move a touchdown. Yeah. So you can get in on Kansas City right away. Now, of course, you're not guaranteed to win. The yeah. Chiefs almost lost the game, but you know your odds of beating Aaron Rodgers at a pick 'em are much better than, or much worse than the guy who's backing him up, who's never started. So uh, I think the awards markets are interesting on that. Like, I guess in theory, if you like found all 30 voters, contacted them, and figured out who they were planning on voting for, or like read the tea leaves, you could maybe, but by then like the markets are kind of settled yeah 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 i was i was really lucky once i got the tweet like pete buddha judge uh exits presidential campaign in 2020 before anyone else did and it was like thank you for the free you know 800 dollars. you know you got to get to you know anyway so um a good way to make money is to be lucky uh, a sustainable way to make money is to uh you know be smart so um i guess i'm through my list so did i did i miss anything is there um uh any juice you got that I don't know about? I I don't think so. I feel like we covered a lot of the basics, you know, get, getting uh, buy low and sell high and reading information and understanding what really matters and what really doesn't. Like, I, it's kind of crazy how the overlap is between sports and politics betting. I'm like, I don't have the time like you do, to, like, because I'm focused on sports to go yeah, yeah. deep into the weeds on politics, but I kind of wish I did. Um, but yeah, I think there, there's less of like the fundamentals in sports, right? Yeah. Like. In politics, like it's a midterm, yeah. probably going to be bad for the Democrats. That should yeah. always be the thing that like somebody hits you in the head with whenever I get a little too optimistic. But yeah, uh, yeah I think uh, I think we covered a good amount of kind of the, the overlaps. Well, so, OK, so how about this? I'm going to put you on the spot. Do you want to um, do you want to pitch a trade, one political trade and um, uh, maybe one football trade? And uh, we'll we'll um, let the future be the, uh, the judge of the present. Yeah, that sounds good. Uh, let's go Super Bowl because okay. I'm not sure when we're gonna when this will be out, and uh, I want it to be evergreen. Uh, my Super Bowl pick at the beginning of the year was the Baltimore Ravens at 20 to one. You can still get them at 15 to one. They're probably not going to win the Super Bowl. So the one thing I te tell people all the time, like you're betting a, a team at 15 to one, that's like eight percent implied. They're probably not winning the Super Bowl. But let's consider their price versus the Bills and the Chiefs, who I think are clearly the two best teams in the conference. The Bills and the Chiefs are the two Super Bowl favorites. They have the two big name quarterbacks. They were in the championship. You know, they were the two favorites last year. Baltimore went into last season as one of the Super Bowl favorites. They had a, more injuries than any team in the last 20 years. They're finally getting healthy this year. They just played Buffalo. It was a three-point game decided on the final play of the game. Baltimore led 20 to three. So they're clearly not that much worse than the Bills if they're in that game. And I think they're going to be in that game if they were to meet again in the playoffs. And they beat Kansas City last year before everybody got hurt. So they've shown that they can play with the Bills and the Chiefs. Yeah. And you're getting them at 15 to 1, where I think the real price should be like 10 to 1, maybe 9 to 1. It depends on the seating now. But again, Baltimore has lost two games this season. They had a 20 point lead in one and a 17 point lead in the other. Their secondary has been hurt, but they're going to get healthy. I think the Ravens are a dark horse in the, in the AFC. The AFC is loaded. And my, my NFC dark horse at the beginning of the year was the Eagles. And they're off to a great start. You can't buy the Eagles now, though. In yeah. fact, I think it's time to look at play against the Eagles because they, they were so good the first few weeks. They haven't really played any great teams yet. Uh, and now they're the third favorites for the Super Bowl. I don't think they're that good. Yeah, uh, but it's, a, it's time, time to get off the Eagles trade. Yeah, no, I like, I like the Baltimore trade. I mean, if they're playing within three points of uh, Kansas City and the Bills, like that's one injury. You know, one yeah, or you one know. weird play, right? Yeah, yeah, it's just one little fluky thing. Uh, okay, put it in the bank, and then uh, what are you trading? Senate races? Or are you trading House or Senate control? What are you? What are you into over on the political side? Yeah, so the exclusiveness of my trades is buying low on the GOP and the Senate. Uh, I haven't done enough of the math and the homework in like the House to to try to predict like House races. Uh, I like I think it's a pretty clear GOP takeover. I yeah. I'm, I'm disheartened by this, you know, as a, as a partisan Democrat, but I think you have to be honest and take a step back and, and look at the numbers. The GOP is juiced for turnout. I think, I think Democrats will turn out in a big way because of Dobbs. So I think that kind of leads it down to independence and Biden's numbers are not good with independence. Yeah. I think a lot of the polls are showing a lot of undecideds who are not fans of Mr. Biden, and they're probably going to vote against us, uh, against the Democrats in November. So I took some Oz. I don't know what he's trading at now. I haven't looked. I I saw. I took him at forty cents. I yeah, think yeah. it's a toss up. I really do. 
like Fetterman's a better candidate by like the traditional candidate quality, right? Of course, because people like nobody really likes Oz here. They're kind of just like even my friends who are Republicans who are like diehard Trumpers are like, yeah, we don't like Oz, but we would vote for anybody before we voted for John Fetterman. Right. So we're going to vote for Dr. Oz. So they'll all come home. Like the GOP is always good at that. So I think the independents will uh, make your break. And I, I can see a lot of suburban Pennsylvanians who are horrified by Doug Mastriano and will not be voting for him. They'll feel nice and comfy. They'll be like, oh, yeah, look at me. I'm, I'm ticket splitting. I'm voting for Josh Shapiro, the Democrat who has, uh, you know, believes in abortion like I do. And then, you know what, Dr. Oz, he's a weird guy, but like Fetterman's kind of weird too. So I'm going to vote for Oz. I'm going to split my ticket because I'm a true moderate and uh, I hated Donald Trump, but Oz is so different from him. Like he's just kind of weird, not like crazy. Yeah. So I think there's going to be enough of those that it's like truly a toss up. So I think anything, any dog price on Oz, I'm interested. Uh, dog price on, I guess the, the Nevada Senate's gone, but uh, I'm yeah, this might be coming in, back. I wouldn't. I wouldn't write Catherine Cortez Masto off. I'm not. Yet. That's the thing, and that's the thing too. Now we're getting to the point where I might be buying Catherine because yeah, yeah. the polls always underestimate Dems. There, I feel like they just like get the voters turned out, and there's just more Democrats. So uh, I'm I'm not sure that that race has gone that far. And then just overall Senate control, it's hard to see the Democrats running the trifecta. Like they have to win. If they lose Wisconsin, right, they, yeah, only, they would have gone. to win every other race yeah. pretty much. Yeah, so they're going like, to lose Wisconsin. I'm, I'm, right. I'm putting the Dunn chain on Wisconsin. Um, but, you yeah. know, these, these candidates on the Republican side are, uh, you know, if you follow the news at all, you know that they are, some of them yeah. are a little shaky. So I was ready to buy Herschel. And yeah. then the news came out and I'm like, dude, like, what are we doing here? <laughs> like, yeah. how, how, even still, I might, but I think GOP is a safer bet because even if the candidates aren't great in Georgia and Pennsylvania and Arizona, like the wins are that like one or two is probably going to win. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. I there will probably be out. one who like we look back and we're like, man, how did they elect that guy to be the to be the nominee? And we're going to laugh at them. Yeah. But like, I don't know that we're going to say that about all of them. Yeah. If we do, like that would be, that would I be mean, hilarious. George, from, I'm glad you mentioned point of view. Georgia, I mean, Georgia is like, Georgia's like betting on the Bears in January in a snowstorm. Like all of the conditions favor them to win at home. You know, like Brian Kemp, the Republican governor, is going to blow out Stacey Abrams. Uh, yeah. But Herschel Walker is just so bad. And I guess the Bears are always so bad that, you know, you can even when all the, you know, when the wind's at their back, you can't really count on them to, to deliver. So, um, I'll be very interested to see how that race goes. I'm currently betting against Walker, but uh, I've got most of my money out of the markets right now, actually, if I'm being completely honest. So. It's interesting. I, I know that like in with Walker's case, I the same way I could see these suburban moderates being like, oh yeah, we'll vote for Shapiro and Oz. I could see those same people being like, yeah, Raphael Warnock is cool. Like yeah. Walker, I only ever hear bad news about him. So there's going to be enough ticket splitting. Yeah, I know ticket splitting's on the decline. Like David Shores talked about that a lot and he's right, but. Uh, I think like we're not used to these like insane, right, right, like drama candidates. So it's right. weird. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, but so I'm far, on GOP Senate too. Any dog price on GOP Senate is is gold, for my opinion. Like anything under fifty, I love the GOP Senate because I like the Democrats have to run an inside straight to win all these races, and it just seems unlike. Yeah, uh, yeah. Even if I we mean, do turn out in big numbers, that's been a great bet. You know, I, I, I. I'm hard on myself. You know, I think if you're good at what you do, you should be hard on yourself. But I'm very happy with how I played it. I, I played, uh, you know, GOP when they were dogs, uh, sold, you know, Dems knew they were going to make a comeback. Uh, but now my money's out of the market. You know, I think the markets are getting close to where they should be. And then you just got to be smarter. And that's hard. So I'm going to wait as long as possible to get back in because I just frankly don't feel like I, um, I've got an advantage right now. So uh, humility from betters, but um, I think humility is ultimately uh, an asset to have in your pocket. Sometimes one of the best make bet, the, one of the best bets you can make is to not make a bet at all, right? That's that's definitely one thing. You know, trying to bet into a market that you think is efficient, like if there's no edge, don't just throw money around. You're probably going to yeah. lose. Yeah, but I, I'll hit you with one last cliche, which is, uh, where have you lost the most money? Because I know I've lost the most money in the bets I didn't make. So, um, you know, maybe I'm just kind mm. of a weenie, but yeah, I mean, there's always like the the thing that happens, like uh, there'll be like a soccer game or like a, a baseball game where you're like, oh, I love the 
this team. I, I stared at it for so long. I didn't pull the trigger and now they're up three, nothing in the first inning. God yeah. damn. Right. Yeah. Uh, I think for me on like a kind of like a bigger trend is, uh, you know, I talk about regressing to the mean a lot when I talk about sports betting. Like, I think this team is closer to here. You look at their underlying numbers. They're really here. We're, we're making bets that a team will start to perform back to what we think they should be. And thus they're undervalued. Sometimes we don't know where the floor is. Yeah. And there are definitely dangerous times where you're like, I don't know that there's a political comparison for this, but like, there are definitely times where I'm like, all right, we're going back to the well on this soccer team that's lost five in a row. And I, I know my priors are that they should be better. They just keep sinking and sinking. And, and I just keep betting the same team and they keep losing. So yeah. I think there's definitely like, and then eventually, eventually the regression ends up coming, but I've lost so much that like <laughs> I'm barely making it back by the end. Right. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Or I stop betting against them because I just like, I give up. And that's exactly the time when I should say, no, I need to keep at it um, because it's more week to week, you know, sports betting. Yeah, no, that's uh, can definitely relate to that. I have to remind myself that what we talk about as political bettors or as predictors of politics is usually a couple of weeks ahead of what the public is thinking about. So like when you think the trend can't possibly reverse, just wait a couple more weeks because that's usually when the public's consciousness will catch up to kind of what the market says. So. Right. Like buy low and sell high. Well, I try to be ahead of the buying low when yeah. I'm out is probably a good sign that you should be in. Yeah. And, and I, you know, it's hard. It's easy to say that when you're sitting here just talking, but then when you're in the moment and you keep losing, you're like, yeah. am I really going to do this again? Yeah. Yeah. There's nothing worse. I, I, I'm a competitive person. So just the act of losing is bad enough, much less, you know, having financial consequences is miserable. So that's not what we're here to talk about. We're here to tell uh, sports bettors who follow you over at the Action Network that political gambling is a great way to spend an even numbered year. Uh, and of course, to invite uh, our audience to follow you. Uh, wh where can they find you, Anthony? Yeah, so uh, I'm on Twitter at Anthony Debundo, D-A-B-B-U-N-D-O. I tweet random jokes, analytics, and and uh, you know my work at the Action Network. I cover uh, soccer, baseball, and college hoops. Those are the, the three sports that I am primarily focused on, uh, European soccer, that is. Uh, and then I also do some contributing for NFL. Like I tend to do more macro stuff, like looking at the bigger picture with the NFL coverage, because we have people that are much smarter than me that do the game-to-game -game kind of stuff. Uh, and then you can follow us in our app and listen to our podcasts and whatnot. Uh, Wonder Goal, Payoff Pitch, talking soccer and baseball all the time. We have a lot of fun. We do uh, good number stuff. And then, uh, you know, we'll 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 be doing some kind of midterm coverage. I don't know what it is, but uh, I'm I'm going to write some kind of piece or something, being like, "Hey, I'm buying this GOP time." Uh, yeah, please unfortunately. do. It's like a for me for me personally, it's like an emotional hedge. Yeah. I'm already going to be stressed on on that day, like that midterm day. I work in I work for like a local candidate. He's in a tight race. Like that's going to be stressful. But then like when I turn on the TV and I see Senator Oz, I'm going to be like, what are we doing here? Yeah, yeah. From a personal point of view, but I'll make a little bit of cash if it happens. So we'll see. All right. And we'll have to get you back for the World Cup. So um, uh, yes, that is coming up in a month. Oh my goodness. Yeah, I know. I can't believe it. Um, all right. So we, Anthony DeBundo, Action Network. Um, you'll have to come back. Let us know how your foray into actual political campaigning goes. And uh, hopefully the bets will hit too. So um, thanks for joining us and uh, we'll see you next time.